Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to thank uh, Laurie and Joel for inviting me. And my talk has a lot of information, which I'm not going to read verbatim and on it. You can uh, watch the video from uh, the presenters, or you can email me, and I'll email you a copy of the uh, presentation and the information that uh, is in it. Thanks, Laura. Okay, so we'll skip that. I've got a lot of experience with this. I've been dealing with nitrifiers for about 35 years. I started out probably where all you guys are and then found out that what was it written in all the books was wrong and then have strived to connect that. And um, nitrification at its basics is the conversion of ammonia to nitrite and then the nitrite to nitrate. It's a biochemical conversion though. And that's where it gets interesting. For years, it was written, taught in all the classes that the ammonia was converted to nitrite by Nitrous Ammonis Europea, and that the nitrite was converted to nitrate by Nitrobacter Winogratsky. Those bacteria do those things. They just don't happen to do that in aquariums. And that was my PhD dissertation showing that to be the case. Um, what we're going to go through, though, is not my PhD. We're going to go through practical stuff. You guys are dealing with valves and water and electricity and keeping fish alive. And I'll argue that really what you're doing is keeping nitrifying bacteria alive. People come to look at the fish, but if you don't have the nitrifiers, there's not going to be many institutes that have fish to look at. And why is that important? Or why is it important for you to understand that is because really, like I said, what you're doing is keeping nitrifiers alive. So you need to know a little bit about what they like and don't like and treat them as basically an invisible fish in your system. So why is nitrification needed? Because fish are ammonia thelic. They excrete ammonia and not urea. They excrete ammonia from the gills right into the water by passive diffusion. Elasmobranchs, on the other hand, are urea thelic like humans. They excrete urea, which means they have to use energy to produce that urea uh, in the liver. And then the bottom line is ammonia is toxic. If it builds up, it will kill your fish. Without nitrification, that's what would happen. So now let's talk about forms of ammonia. This is also confusing is there's two forms. Unionized ammonia, which you can see unionized means that there's no charge on it. That's ammonia. Ionized ammonia, NH4 plus, called ammonium. The sum of this is called total ammonia. So at any time, there's a relationship between the amount of unionized ammonia and ionized ammonia in the water that equals the total ammonia. Your test kits almost always are measuring total ammonia. The percentage of each depends upon the pH of the water, the water temperature, and to a certain extent, the salinity of the water, with pH playing the major role. And this is what you can, uh, this graph kind of shows you which, how that works, is that this is the percent unionized ammonia at different pHs in water. So at a pH of 7.5, there's not too much difference. But if you get to a pH of 8.5, in 20 degrees, there's about 12% of the total ammonia is in the unionized form, where if you work up in temperature, you can see that here it's going to be almost 20% just by temperature change. And then you can see the pH shift, too. So if that can work if you're keeping African cichlids and you're keeping high pH water, you, you have problems. Uh, we're going to go into that a little bit. So the other thing is units. Unfortunately, test kits measure in different units. This is like measuring in centimeters or inches. You can measure these chemicals in their ionized form, ion form, which is ammonia. And test kits don't even tell you what ion they're measuring, unionized or ionized, or the nitrite ion or the nitrate ion. Or you can measure them as nitrogen. This is kind of like a base 10 or base 2 when in mathematics. But it makes a big difference. If you call your friend up at another institute and say, oh, my ammonia is off the scale. I got 10. 
you know, 10 milligrams per liter, 10 parts per million. 10 what? Are you measuring in the nitrogen base? Or are you measuring in the ion base? And the difference can be shown here. This, this is illustrative. If you have 2 milligrams per liter ammonia nitrogen, if you measure the ion, it would be 3 if your units were that. If you're doing 2 milligrams per liter nitrite nitrogen, if you're measuring the ion, it's going to come up to almost 7. There's a big difference between 7 and 2. It's the exact same amount. You know, that length of the ruler is the same, except one gives you 2 inches, the other says 7 inches. But you don't know what the units are. It's kind of like that satellite that bounced off the moon because they got, you know, centimeters and, um, you know, the metric in the English system wrong. Uh, or nitrate is, is even more, 2 milligrams per liter nitrate nitrogen is going to equal almost 9 milligrams per liter in the ion form. Most, some of the most popular test kits measure in the ion form, some measure in the nitrogen base form, and a few others don't even tell you what they measure. So if you're making your own standards, you need to, you need to standardize on one. My master's was in ammonia toxicity. I've done a lot of work with nitrogen and ammonia preferred to do in the base. And the reason is, and it'll become evident in a few more slides, if you're going to cycle a tank and you're dosing 2 milligrams per liter nitrogen, nitro ammonia nitrogen, you will find 2 milligrams per liter nitrite nitrogen, and that will produce 2 milligrams per liter nitrate nitrogen. So you don't have to do any of this math. You dose the ammonia in the form of ammonia nitrogen, the units of ammonia nitrogen, and you can literally follow that across the system as you mature your newly set up biofilter. It's much easier that way. Unionized ammonia is the toxic form. Why? Just like it passively diffuses out of the fish, well, it can passively diffuse inside into the fish. And how does that happen? It happens when the ammonia concentration in the water is higher than the ammonia concentration in the fish, the one, the ammonia is going in, and secondly, the fish can't get rid of the ammonia that it's pro being produced by its food. That's how they produce the ammonia is the deaminization of the protein that they eat. And there's a lot of literature out there that says it affects the gills at super high concentrations. It does, but generally what happens is that it affects the central nervous system and so your fish will be darting around. Classic ammonia toxicity is your fish darting very fast, and then they'll slow down, maybe porpoise at the water, slowly sink to the bottom. That's generally a clear sign of ammonia toxicity. Um, and what's acutely toxic is one milligram per liter ammonia nitrogen. Uh, there's charts and tables that would tell you how much total ammonia that equals. This is not total ammonia. This is milligram per, or milligram per liter unionized ammonia, nitrogen. Most of your fish will die within 24 to 96 hours. This is LC50 test. Again, this is what I did my master's on. It all depends. Rainbow trout, they would die very soon at this concentration. Catfish, on the other hand, would take a lot longer. They're, they're much more resistant. Saltwater fish, again, it depends on the fish that you're talking about of how fast they're going to die, but that's generally acutely toxic. Um, and then chronically toxic is 0.1 milligram per liter, and chronically means the fish are stressed, they're going to be more susceptible to diseases, they're not going to grow very well, and it'll manifest itself as a fin rot and things like that. Nitrite is also toxic, it's called brown blood uh, disease, and it basically at high nitrogen concentrations, the fish blood is not able to grab oxygen out of the water and circulate oxygen through the fish, so instead of the gills being nice and bright red, they'll be brown. It's much more a problem in freshwater systems because this, uh, in salt, the chloride, high chloride concentration in salt has a positive effect against brown blood disease. So one of the things, if you're running a freshwater system, you find a lot of nitrite in the water, one of the quick things you can do, besides a water change, is add some salt. And most fr freshwater fish can tolerate at least three or five parts per thousand salt in your system, about one-tenth 
uh, seawater. Um, now this is the traditional view, as I said, on nitrification. There's lots of assumptions about that, that the bacteria were exactly the same, whether it's fresh water or salt water, they were the same bacteria. And they were Nitrosomonas europea or Nitrobacter winogradsky. But if you go into the literature, you'll find that there were lots of hints that that really wasn't what people were seeing. It's what the book said, but practical experience was saying that's not what we were seeing. And then in the mid-90s, it became possible to really study microbial ecology. I'm by background a fish ecologist. You can go out on a reef and you can do surveys and you know what uh, a uh, puffer fish looks like or a rock fish out in Southern California looks like. It was a little more difficult with bacteria because bacteria only come in a couple of different shapes and you couldn't tell one from another. Using modern molecular methods, which I'm not going to go into, you're able to actually design these molecular probes so that we could look at specific species of bacteria and see where they live. And we could come up with these phylogenetic relationships based on this DNA principles. And nowadays, we can go right to a filter, to water, whatever we want, grab a sample without culturing, and we can tell you who's there, what percentages of bacteria are there at the species level. And really, to cut to the chase, in saltwater aquaria, the bacteria are these Nitrosomonas asteri, or halophilia, salt-loving, or found in an estuary, and Nitrospira marina. Th those are actually the bacteria that you need to put in these saltwater systems, and it turns out mostly in freshwater there's ones that are closely related to these, but they are different species. So if you're going to move a system from freshwater to salt or saltwater to fresh, you have to have the right biofilter. This is what the bacteria looks like. With these molecular probes and an expensive microscope and a little bit of technique, we can actually light up the samples and doesn't show so well, but these are the ammonia oxidizing bacteria in green, and then the nitrite oxidizers are in red, and if you have a super expensive microscope, confocal laser microscope, you can actually get the microscope to count the number of cells that are lit up and do ecological studies on this. So with all that, what have we learned? What's the practical application of all this microbiology is that that back this, you know, these processes will occur, but what's your problem is you as operators will find that construction took a lot longer, but the, the hard startup date stays the same. So instead of having three months to season your system and get your biofilter going, you might have two weeks. What are you going to do? How are you going to grow these bacteria? Are you going to go buy bacteria? How are you going to get the system up? Okay, and bacteria behave real differently in the real world. Did you leach your tank? Do you have high pH, low pH? What's your calcium level? They react to these things just like fish would react to these things. And the most important thing is that all this nitrification takes place in the space of 100 microns. I'm skipping because of time restraints, but this is 100 microns. This is why you have sand filters and all these mechanical filters, is to keep that detritus out of your biofilter. Because what happens if your biofilter is covered up with all the organic de debris that's being produced is that smothers the biofilter. Picture a layer of crud over this, and now oxygen can't get into where the nitrifiers are living, nor can the ammonia or the nitrite. So a real take-home story is keep your biofilters clean. These bacteria, they love to stick to things. People will say, I've got cloudy water. My nitrifiers are blooming. Nitrifiers don't bloom. They grow, they double in 20 to 30 hours versus heterotrophic bacteria that bloom in, or double in 20 minutes. Nitrifiers want to stick to a surface. They're not in your water column. I have literally filtered thousands of gallons of water looking for nitrifiers. They're, very, they're not there very often, only when they're stressed. They basically want to stick to a surface, your job is to keep that surface clean so they can work because everything takes place in a very narrow strip. Now some differences between the old, you know, what's written in the book. These are sewage treatment bacteria. There's not much similarity between a sewage treatment plant and your fish tank. Sewage treatment plants work at above 10 milligrams per liter ammonia nitrogen, maybe even 50, very high concentrations. 
That's not what you have in your aquariums. These guys, the nitrous ammonis marina, their growth is inhibited if you get above five milligrams per liter. Why is that important? Say you're gonna start up a new system and you're gonna start dosing ammonia. How much ammonia do you wanna dose? Should you bulk, just dump a bunch in? Should you meter it in? You should meter it in, keep the concentration low. The bacteria can handle that much faster. They're also very important, intolerant of nitrite. If you let your nitrite level build up, meaning you've got the ammonia oxidizers converting ammonia to nitrite, now you've got to get the nitrite oxidizers working, and they're much slower growing, so you've got to give them a chance. The whole system will break down if you let the nitrite build up. This is where, especially in saltwater systems, people have problems. I got no ammonia, but my nitrite's 10 or 12 milligrams per liter. You've got to do a water change to kickstart those bacteria in. They're inhibited by high concentrations of nitrite. Uh, direct benefits of knowing about the bacteria is we know they're different and we can grow the right ones and we know what conditions they like and don't like. Um, seeding a new biofilter, this is courtesy of uh, the New England Aquarium. It's not an endorsement, it's just a courtesy they allowed me to share bacteria, but basically they had the problem that every one of you will have or have had is they had a very short period of time to basically get a 25,000 gallon system up and running, a touch tank. How are they gonna do this? They came to me and asked what should we do, and we set up a dosing pump where they were continuously dosing ammonia at a low level 24 hours a day into the system. This is, this is the uh, amount they were able to dose, and then they added a seed of a bacteria. And instead of dosing the entire 25,000 gallons, they were able to take part of the system and isolate it to just under 5,000 gallons. That way they're only having to dose ammonia to 5,000 gallons instead of 25,000 gallons. Added an inoculum of nitrifying bacteria and basically in six days that system was cycled and they could put the whole system online and bring in their animals. I know I'm going over this very fast, but that clock's turning redder and redder. Um, I'll be here all afternoon and we can talk about this and I, I, I apologize for having to go so fast. But this is what you can do. You don't, now you don't have to buy your own bacteria. There are secrets to uh, you know, culturing. If you're culturing bacteria, you've got some bio balls in a back room with a trash can. What should you do with those? How often should you feed those? A little bit every couple of days. Bacteria, one, are not going to starve to death. They don't starve to death, period. Secondly, don't, so you don't have to be feed them every day. And secondly, if they don't have lungs, this is the thing I hear all the time, well, we can't keep them very long because they're not breathing. Bacteria don't have lungs. If we go back to that first equation, you'll see they only need oxygen when they're converting ammonia. If you don't feed them ammonia, they don't need oxygen. So maintaining healthy nitrifiers, Generally, in a new filter, about 20% of your bacterial biomass will be nitrifiers, but as you're running it, it's down to 2 or 5%. Uh, the nitrifiers grow more slowly in seawater. That's because more of the energy that they're producing has to be go into just maintaining the cell, not into dividing. It's about half the speed in saltwater versus freshwater, the division. Why is division important? It's because this is all a numbers game. People come to me, well, how fast can I get this filter cycled? Well, how much money do you have if you want to, you know, so how much bacteria can you buy? It's, and it's just all that, it's really that simple, is how much bacteria do you have or, or how, and how much do you want? Uh, some tricks, because they work slower in seawater, when you're initially seeding a filter, reduce the salinity. The freshwater guys go up to about 10 parts per thousand. Above 10 parts per thousand, if you're running a brackish water system, you want to grow the saltwater guys. So what you can do is reduce the salinity and increase the temperature. It's very much related to temperature. You know, there's literature out there, you can't, you know, it's too hot. No, we grow these bacteria in, in uh, Fahrenheit at almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit because the, faster, the higher the water temperature, the faster they grow. And I've been growing these things for 15 years in large commercial tanks. You all raise fish, I raise bacteria. Um, nitrite oxidizers grow more slowly than the, than the ammonia guys, 
So what you can do, instead of adding ammonia all the time, is add a little nitrite. S make your culture more of the nitrite oxidizers by adding more nitrite in the beginning. Also, the nitrite guys are canary in the coal mine. A lot of tank facilities, we monitor ammonia, ammonia, ammonia. You're going to see low nitrite levels long before you see ammonia levels. The nitrite bacteria will stop working long before the ammonia bacteria. And nitrite, luckily, is a very easy test, and it's a very precise test. It's basically one, uh, two reagents you mix together. It'll turn pink, and it's quite reliable. So I would measure nitrite long before I measured ammonia to tell you if the systems are having problems or not. And they grow as flocks when they're happiest on surfaces, clean surfaces. That's what you need to provide them. You can, you can you know, wash those surfaces, rinse those surfaces. They're that slime that's on there. It's a little orange colored because they like iron. That's another trick. You can add a little bit of iron to the water to get them growing. I, I won't go into that physiology, but that helps speed their growth. And you can you know, take out a filter pad if you're doing that or the filter media and rinse it vigorously in fresh water to knock off all that loose material. That's just debris and detritus. That's not nitrifiers. So once they're established and stuck on a good media, you actually can treat that media rather harshly to clean it uh, and then put them back in, the, back in the water. I know this is, you know, sacrilegious. They can also tolerate a little bit of chlorine. Actually, they can tolerate a ton of chlorine. And that's a whole other field in drinking water systems of the nitrifiers. Real quick, you add chloramine these days to drinking water systems. Well, chloramine has the NH2 in it. That dissociates and produces ammonia as the water goes to your house. The nitrifiers grow on the inside of those water distribution pipes. So by the time the water reaches your house, it has high nit nitrate concentrations because a bunch of nitrification has happened in the water distribution system, which is a big problem with water distribution companies, which is another field I work in. Um, so they're pretty strong. Lastly, real quick, is everything I told you changes at 10 degrees, at 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and below? And this work was actually discovered in public aquariums. And that is that it, below these low temperatures, it seems that it's not these, quote, bacteria. It's these other organisms called, and, and two other procedures, anamox, for, for, and, it, and then archaeal ammonia oxidizers. And these procedures were demonstrated in, the res in research at the uh, Shedd Aquarium and also the Seattle Aquarium. And I'm going to go through this in 30 seconds. <laughs> but basically, there's a group of bacteria that take ammonia and they combine it with nitrite and they go right to dinitrogen. So basically, they're de doing denitrification in one step. These bacteria are real. It's trying to figure out how to grow them is, is the case. And it is an anaerobic process that doesn't require the addition of inorganic carbon. So you don't, or organic carbon. You don't have to add glucose or sucrose or anything like that. It's being used more and more in wastewater systems. No public aquarium or aquarium facility has adapted that yet. The carbon is from carbon dioxide, which there's plenty of that in the water. Um, then these bacteria, they look like this. It can be done. Well, how can it be done in this big film out in the open? Is because that film gets very thick. Instead of keeping it clean, we let the film go thick. It goes anaerobic on the inside, and that's where we can grow these bacteria and have this process done. And I guess I just got shut off. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, the, the doubling time is 10 days. We're talking about you know, 20 hours, 30 hours. These bacteria, this is watching concrete dry, getting these guys to work. So they're very, very slow, uh, but it can be done. And then the other is archaeal, which is, we were talking about ammonia oxidizing bacteria. This is ammonia oxidizing archaeal, which were found to dominate in cold water. This was done at the Tokyo Aquarium by a professor down now who's down in Florida. And what he's able to find is when then you went to cold water and the bacteria I grow, that's what I've always found. If somebody comes to me and says, I got really cold water. Can I get your bacteria? The answer is not the normal ones. I got to give you a special culture because they switch to these ammonia oxidizing archaeal uh, organisms. I almost said bacteria, which would be wrong. Um, 
And basically, this study sh really demonstrated quite well that at these low temperatures, you need a whole different assemblage of microorganisms for ammonia oxidation. And to sum up, starting, this is the last slide, uh, then lunch, uh, continuous ammonia dosing at a low level is better than dumping ammonia in. Turn your water temperature up, then you can bring it down. If you, even if you're going to have a cold water system, turn it up first if you don't have organisms in it, and then drop it two to three degrees Celsius a day down to your target temperature. Resist the use of ammonia-removing chemicals to control ammonia. All right, the primes and the amquils at high concentrations, they just mess up these bacteria. All right, I, I sell these chemicals. I know how they work on the bacteria. Resist using them. Troubleshooting. This is your biggest problem. Don't let the nitrite get high. When you're cycling or starting up a system, really be monitoring nitrite and let that control the ammonia additions you make. Your nitrite's high, don't add ammonia. Turn off the dosing pump for 24 hours. Your ammonia oxidizing bacteria are not going to starve to death. They'll be perfectly fine. And let the nitrite oxidizing bacteria do their job and bring that nitrite level down. Check your water flow, check your alkalinity, because this process does produce hydrogen ions, which means your alkalinity is being consumed, which means your pH and your alkalinity is going to drop. You need to supplement that. And then there's a whole list of references in my work here. I thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Lori. Sorry I had to go so fast. But I'll be here afternoon, all afternoon. I love to talk about this stuff and can overwhelm you with data publications videos and things like that. <laughs> Thanks.